ability, but we do know at 12, if we stand pat, we're going to get a really good player. Um, and with that, we'll take your questions. Um, yeah, guys, you said really good player at 12. You know, doesn't it have to be, given this standard around here with more Super Bowls and losing seasons for a long time, Elway, Manning, don't you have to get a quarterback? Look, I mean, do we have to draft a quarterback? You'd say, man, it sure looks like we have to draft a quarterback. And yet, um, it's it's got to be the right fit, the right one. And if we had the tip sheets as to who everyone else was taking, it'd be easier to answer that question. Um, and so, that's the that's the puzzle here. You yeah, what know. you don't want to do, Mike, is force it, and uh, you know otherwise we'll be in this position next year and the years after. So you, you want to get the right player at twelve. Our first pick, we got to hit on. Whether it's a quarterback, whether it's a tackle, receiver, you name it, uh, we need to get an impact player. For, for either of you, um, Shawnee sort of alluded to it. Is it with the number of quarterbacks that are in the mix this year and the number of teams that could use one, does it feel like there's more uncertainty about how the first 10 or so picks shake out, or does it, is it about normal in that regard? Well, I think typically speaking, every year at this time, um, Obviously, there's a lot of attention on the draft. It's exciting. I, I think it's um, obviously ex exciting for us, the scouts, everyone involved. But I also, I think it's um, I think it's exciting for the fans. Meaning, you know, that some may have gotten a glimpse of these guys at the combine. But there's, and and where I'm going is, it's generally the first round. And if you really narrow it down the focus for the fans are like those first 15 picks you know and and uh and yeah the part of the puzzle if 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 we were looking at our draft board and you looked at the screen and you said team needs um you know there's a handful of teams ahead of us where you'd say quarterback and you know there's and then there's a a team or two Minnesota ourselves the Raiders you could you could argue quarterback and <clears throat> that's what makes it this year a little interesting. Um, but I think, you know, 95% every year, 95% of the discussion is on 5% of the draft because it's hard for anyone to say, uh, God, I like this guy in the fourth round. You know, wait a minute, I can't keep track of that. I got to go to work. I got the first round figured out, you know, uh, for the fan. Um, so I think uh, each year there's there's years that's stronger in certain positions, and and then the team needs to factor into that. Sean, a couple months ago at the combine, you alluded to having a lot of belief in y'all's quarterback evaluation process. Yeah. So now that you've been through a couple months of meetings, interviews, all that, like, what do you, you know? What did you kind of learn from that process and? Uh, how, and do you feel even stronger about your faith in the process you guys have? Yeah, I, look, I think the business we're in in the beginning, you know, we have all the tape. Um, and, and then it's you're gathering as much information as you can. You're, you're gathering um, all the metric, you know, the stuff we can measure. Then you're gathering the interaction, personality, learning, you're, you know, which is very important. Uh, the, the, all of that so that you can make the best decision uh, relative to how you grade them. You know, you're, you're um, obviously, historically speaking, you, you'd say that it's not a perfect science. You know, shoot, we met last night with, we have a great analytics department, and, and you're going to see in the next five, ten years, AI, artificial intelligence, begin to, you know, help in this process as you now again you you have to provide it with what you think is important and um, so I, I think it's man you, you know there's been a lot of flights you know a lot of a lot of miles traveled and but for good reason and uh, and and the process back to what George said the process is is gone really good you know, it hadn't been easy all the time and yet. We've had really good discussions down there, and uh, um, yeah. 
Sean, uh, Coach and George, just for both of you, when you, you look at the quarterback position, when you rank your board, I mean, all your players in an order, but when you, at 12, do you allow yourself to say, this quarterback for us is 22, but at 12 is where we're staying, we can't move? Does that figure into it, the value of the position as to where you draft to where you have that player ranked on your draft board, or does the quarterback become that great over, you know, just overrule stuff? I, well, let me, I'll give you my two cents, and then I, I think this, I think historically speaking, we, our league has always valued certain positions, you know, quarterback, tackles, corners, pressure players, um, and so that factors into the grade, um, and Belichick was on this podcast the other day, which was kind of interesting because you get a, a chance to to hear him in a different light. And, and I've gotten to know him over the years. And he said something that was interesting. Just He's like, look, every one of these teams' boards are different, like dramatically. And then obviously when you move away from one, the margin of difference expands. You know, in other words, as you get closer to one, they're still different. And so... Um, but do we factor in the position they play relative to, yeah. I mean, we, we're in these group studies in the fifth round and in the middle of the fifth round, let's say six players and one of them's an edge player and the other's, uh, I don't know, tight end or guard. Um, I don't know that there's any such thing as they're equal, but the, the edge player has more value. We're going through that now. We're going through all sorts of clusters throughout the draft, and we may have a guy in pod two, you know, so to speak, who's one, and, and, and another guy who's seven. The other guy may be an edge player. We value him more, you know. So to answer your question, if it's within reason, now you don't want to, you don't want the huge reach, but if they're in similar graded areas, pods, whatever you want to, buckets. Um, and then you take the value position, whether it's quarterback, whether it's edge, whether it's corner, you know what they are. And so they do, they are a premium. Uh, you, you can't reach too much for those guys, you know. Um, so. George and Coach, for both of you guys, you've talked about the importance of the quarterback being able to process what he's seeing out there, do that quickly. How do you project out if that's something he can improve at, if that's something that's going to take three months, six months, a year, I guess, just what is that process like in terms of figuring out his ultimate capability there from that standpoint? Go ahead. Well, I just think we, we've we just spent as much time as we can with these players. You know, we, we give them the tests in the off season. We watch them in the senior bowl. We watch them in the fall. You try to project. You try to spend it. We fly them in. Um, we spend as many hours with these quarterbacks as we've any other players. And so – Nothing's definite, but you try to project what will be like. Obviously, the tape tells you one thing, and then the meetings, the testing, um, getting around your building, uh, the fit. Um, you're never 100% certain, but you try to project. Uh, you play the odds as much as you can, and you do that by getting around these players as much as possible. There's a lot of discussion. Um, the scouts do a great job. But, you know, There's a lot of discussion with not just the quarterback position, um, with all of these positions as to their ability to learn, <clears throat> retain. And, and so typically speaking, um, we'll get a large group of players. If, you know, is he an A learner? That's, that happens right away. B learner. But the default bin is the C learns. In other words, the college coaches that help us out tremendously, they're great. You know, and if this guy's going to need work, he's a C learner. But – Man, doing this a long time, I don't know that I've ever heard someone say he's an F or a D learner. And so there's a huge bin of C learns that we have to dive into to, to put a C learn, which means, hey, he's a C learn and, or he's not. And then it's, then it's something um, now relative to the quarterback position. Is that standard a little different? Sure, because of their job description and what they have to do. Um, and that, I think, is something that's that's been part of the journey here the last couple of months. I mean, you, you watch the tape, and but you know, how do they spit it out in the huddle? There's a lot of different offenses, 
you know, we've had, it's funny when we bring some of these guys in or we go to the schools to visit and, you know, always finish with, hey, you know, if we take you, um, drop your best play. The play has to come with you. You just love this play and they'll draw it up. And then I'll say, well, how do you call it? And I'm always fascinated to hear their terminology. A lot of times they're signaling plays in. And, and so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's the one thing by just watching film that's hard to predict. And it's even, it's not like it's fail safe when you go out. You know, we try to send them a lot of information at a certain time the day before, go in and see how much they can digest the next the next day. We, we do as much as we can. We try to improve on that each year because even like last night, we spent two hours last night with analytics relative to these position uh, evaluations and, and relative to AI and all these other things that um, can begin to help us, you know, let's say increase our batting average in general um, in the draft process. Uh, I guess for both of you guys, even though you're locked in on your stuff, if you're listening to a Belichick podcast, you're aware there's stuff out there being said. How amused are you during this process when you see people so matter-of-factly say what you're thinking or which players you guys love or what you're definitely going to do or put this big package together for this or that? You know, we, we it's good to have a pulse what's going on out there. I, I probably don't listen to as many podcasts as Sean, um, but it's good to have a pulse <laughs> of the league, obviously. Um, <laughs> You take it with a grain of salt. I mean, really, we don't even know who we're picking at the time. You know, we're at 12. We don't know who's going to be there. We're going through every scenario, every scenario in the first, the third, the fourth. We don't know. So I don't know how anyone else knows. And then when we know, it's only going to be Sean and I. So it's, it's you, 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 you listen to it. You have a pulse of the league. It's really good to, to have a pulse. And then um, no one knows. I, I think, too, it's back to what I said before. I think – I think it's one of the more exciting times of the year for the fan of each team. And um, listen, I've got, you name it. I mean, there are people that, will you know, you get tagged on Twitter. And, and, and so when I read these periodically, these things, and then maybe read something that's a little closer to the best than I like, and I'll, like, click, like, all right, who is, all right, that's, you know, Timmy in Tucson. I don't have to worry about him. He, he's just right. <laughs> but I, I do think it's exciting for the fans, and I think our league has done a really good job um, as this has grown, um, you know, where it used to be just in this hotel ballroom. And, and you, you think about it, we, you had to run, run up your runner with a piece of paper and the name hopefully spelled correctly and lay it down. And then if it's, <laughs> if it's not in time, George, then someone can pass you <laughs> like that. That's happened. Um, and, uh, and where we've come in the different cities that get to host it. Um, so I think the, the big challenge for, for the scouts, for George and I, for Greg Carey, for the, Everyone involved in the process is, you know, I call it this, this NFL train, and it's this sum total of thinking that if you're not careful, you have to pay attention to it, but just don't hop on it. Um, and, and let's say that train is two-thirds right, but it just marches along with information, and you don't really know who's driving it. You follow me? But you just know, and, and so that can influence grades, meaning, you know, 20 years ago, you know, you were grading players, and, it's, you know, the hardest thing for a scout is you're quiet, you're in a hotel room with a computer, and you're typing up a report, and, and you're going by what you just see. And, uh, and maybe then you come back home, and then you, you have another report, another report, and then you um, – but now there's so much that can – that can taint that if you're not careful, that's all. And the coaches, anyone involved in the process, I think that, that's uh, a challenge. I've got a two-part question for you guys over here. Um, you mentioned the start of the off-season program. How has that been in the first week with guys back in the building? And then the second part, you mentioned Greg. Sean, he invested in, in a new field house um, turf. How, is that important for player safety? And what, what will that allow you to use it more? Um, yeah, so the off-season program began Monday. Um, it, man, the turnout was great. Um, 
we're probably, I'd say 98% in, in the two or three individuals that weren't here. I've just talked with all of them. Um, and I think the one thing, and this is a credit to Bo and a lot of people, really, the, the people all involved in, in the weight room and the athletic training room, the people that are treating our players, you know, we, we, we had a big goal of, like, how do we reduce the injuries? I mean, shoot, the first training camp I had with you guys, we had someone get hurt, and it was like, man, here it goes again. And I was like, ah, you know, um, I don't know that it's ever happened before, but we went from 32nd in the league to games missed by, by players uh, on your roster to first in the league by fewest. So we went from 100 and some to 30 some in one year. And I think the simple message on Monday was that's what we're doing right now. You know, it's not football right now. It's we're getting our bodies. And look, we're in the business of selling. You know, it's optional to be here. I think the player today wants to be somewhere where they feel like, man, they are getting a, a real good workout. They're getting the, the food and all the things that go into it, the recovery, if it's a, if it's a player who's, coming off an injury. They want to feel like they're getting that. And <clears throat> compared to maybe where they do where they do it in the offseason, if they feel like where they're coming from is accomplishing more than when they get here, then that's not good. And so the purpose for that message with me was, hey, we're heading the right direction here. Like, look, our job is to maximize your earning potential, win games, and the first step in doing that is is keeping you healthy. And and so that dramatic of a turnaround in one year, there's a ton of people that, that get credit for that. And, um, yeah, and so um, it began. And, and But I don't want them, when they pull into the parking lot, feeling like they're coming to practice. I, you know, it's, it's April. I want them to feel like they're coming to get in shape and to take care of their bodies. And uh, that part of it's been good. And the turf field, I'm sorry, George, George just mentioned it. So I, I, it's the first time I saw it. I hadn't been over here yet, but it looks fantastic. Uh, Sean, intrigued what you said about AI. Is there kind of a, a race in the league right now to kind of figure out best practices, how it's going to really like, help you? Did you? Do you put somebody sort of fully in charge of that kind of department? How, how does it work in terms of how you guys are trying to manage how to use that tool? I think... Look, George had gotten with – we have a great group that um, – man, it's, it's impressive, our group. Um, fortunately, it's not a race like – No, but I, I'm just watching this Netflix series on, on, on the, the Manhattan Project, and that was, a, that was an important race. Um, but I would say I think there's always a sense of urgency of – of getting ahead and creating within the framework of the rules advantages that can help you as a club. Um, and I would say the only thing I would say is we're always open in the door as an eager listener to new ways. And we have to do that as teachers and in the same way when we're evaluating players, how do we, how do we do this better? And, um, and it just so happened last night, we had a pretty lengthy meeting on it that was fascinating and, um, yeah, I think it was good. This is for George and for Sean. I'm going to start with you, George, because you're the one who said it at the beginning of the press conference. You said you feel that you can get a really, really good player at number 12. With that, on your board, and it could change, do you have five quarterbacks in that top 12 right now? Yeah, I'm not going to talk about our board right now, but I appreciate the question, sure. but... Um, I do, I do think it is a good quarterback class. There's seven, eight quarterbacks that we like that think can play in the league one day. I'm not going to get into, you know, how we have them rated or in the top uh, ten. No, I know, but I'm not going to not going to go there. Uh, but it is a good quarterback class. We've it's been fun getting to know them. Um, you know, seven or eight of them, and so we think we can get a quarterback early. We think mid rounds. We think there's going to be quarterbacks, um, you know, throughout the draft that are interesting to us. Any concern? I know it's optional and all that with uh, Cortland not being here, the message he might be sending. Yeah, I mean, it's 100% voluntary, Mike. It's the first week of the off-season program. Sean's talked to Cortland. I've talked to Cortland. He's in a good place. You know, we'll just leave it at that.
And then to change gears just a little bit, Sean, uh, a couple weeks ago, you were a hockey coach for the Blues in the alumni game. How yeah, did, that, how did I, that come about, and uh, what well, did you think of that experience? Listen, I, I, it, was, it was interesting. So there was a benefit for leukemia or cancer in St. Louis, um, and a good friend of mine is fighting that battle right now, Kelly Chase. And he asked me, he asked me if I wanted to coach or play. I had played some, and so I started getting with George, his son, plays ice hockey I'm like where are the rinks around here and I you know I didn't realize I'm like right down the street from University of Denver arena but anyway I, I was never able to get the skates on so I decided I'm you know I'm gonna coach so I we had two teams basically it was an alumni game the Blues alumni versus the NHL alumni and I had the NHL alumni um and there's man, a star-studded cast of players um but my biggest concern, it's the only sport that substitutes on the fly, really. It's pretty pretty interesting. And so, you know, everyone's getting in about the same time the morning of. And, you know, we have a game in six, five hours. And I'm thinking, who's in charge of the substitutions? I know I'm the coach, but, like, how do you – and these guys, like, there's 17 players jump over the wall. Everyone slides to the left. They come off. And they had it all handled. Um, no, it was fun. It was uh, – it was a great. It was a great benefit. Successful. Um, I learned a lot. You pulled the goalie. I pulled the goalie. I, well, I turned to Chelios and I said, "Hey, when do we pull a goalie?" And he said, eh, "About two and a half minutes." And then so I'm like, "All right." And then Ray Whitney, I know, I said, "Wiz, you're going to be our extra man." And uh, <clears throat> so we pulled the goalie and scored to tie it up. Now, if I knew it was going to end in a tie, I would have just kept the goalie <laughs> on the uh, on the bench, but. When I finished, I sent John Cooper a text, and I've known John for a while, the head coach at Tampa Bay, and I said, look, I said, aside from putting on a coat and tie, I like your job description on game day. You know, you, you stand behind the bench. These guys are jumping on and off the ice. Um, I'll handle the goalie decision in the third quarter, um, third period. We played halves. We played halves, actually. We played a first half and second half. That was the only thing I was familiar with. But... Um, Here's the one thing I came away from it, regardless, because we had we had the bigger team. Um, we were ahead 4-2 at the half. We had the bigger team. They had the younger team. That concerned me in an alumni game. And the second half, um, this it kind of flipped on us. And so, um, yeah, I think to see those guys at different age, you know, guys in their 60s, 50s, and they jump back in these skates, and it's like riding a bike front for them. It was fascinating to watch them skate, um, and it was a uh, it was a great event. Uh, uh, Sean, you said at the owners' meetings it would be potentially realistic to trade up high in the draft. Since then, is it more realistic? Since then, less realistic? Since maybe you've learned what the price could be, and would you be willing to trade several future? First round picks the Broncos if it took that. Well, I mean, look, the hypothetical relative to the what the compensation is is it's it's a lot of times driven by who else is interested. So, um, is George? And he's he's talked to all these teams in front of us, and obviously, depending on how much further you, you go up, and then it's also if there's someone else doing the same thing. Um, and so that, I think George said it best uh, at the very beginning. That certainly is a possibility, and and uh, and then it's how much you can pallet. How, how do you just you haven't had first round picks the previous two years? Now you have one. How would you feel about you know last George feeling trading future first round picks? Yeah, I would just say if it's it's a player you think can change the landscape of your organization moving forward like a quarterback, then you do whatever you take to get them. And uh, if there's a consensus in the building, a love in the building, and you're aggressive and you try to get them. doesn't mean you're going to get them, but you try. And so we're open to everything. We're wide open. The fascinating thing relative to first-round picks, you also have to, and it's sometimes hard to do, but when you, when you deal in futures, 
if you think you're going to be picking in the middle or when you deal in futures like two years out, then there's, there's this, we got to get, you know, you don't want to be, so you're really, you're dealing in an unknown value wise. We say it's a first, but the difference between four and 24 <laughs> is pretty significant. So there, there's a lot that goes into that. And, and then there's his, like George and the, they'll be able to give us a history of, all right, in the last five years, this is what it looks like. You know, we've seen it in Chicago, San Francisco, uh, different landmarks from where they're traveling. Um, and then you have to, in either case, you have to have suitors, you know, forward or backward, obviously. For both of you, what would you say your need is at corner and edge? Yeah, I mean, I think we you're always looking for corners, edge, value type positions. We like our corner group, you know, we have one of the best corners in the league. We like our nickel and J-Mac. We have two young outside guys, uh, Riley and Damari and Tremont. So we have a good young group. They're younger. Um, so we, we like the group. You always want, you know, you're always looking to add at those type of positions. You know, the outside backer group, we have three that are really talented. You know, Benito Browning, uh, Jonathan Cooper. We have a young Drew Sanders if he stays outside. So we like the group, but, uh, you're always looking at those type of positions. They're hard to find. You know, if someone falls in your lap, you're going to take them. With the change in the kickoff rules, does that change how you evaluate players in terms of body type, and does it change the value that you would assign to overall players now that a kickoff has been reemphasized? Man, I, I think it's a great question. Um, it's fun that we're doing – I mean, when I say it's fun, I think there's a little unknown. Um, I think this, the distance traveled is going to be not as far. So, you know, when you're covering a kick, um, speed was fairly important uh, relative to getting, as a coverage unit, getting down the field and, and, and getting to the ball carrier. And we've taken that whole group and said, all right, we're going to put you guys 10 yards away. Um, I think certainly it could, you could see uh, probably a little heavier unit then, where speed it, it's it's uh, it's certainly going to put a premium on your two returners because you have to have two and and uh, and then that box where you're kicking the ball to, you know these guys like third basemen are going to have to be able to field you know, these kicks pretty cleanly and, and, uh, but we were for it for a lot of reasons. You know, we had a lot of, a lot of play. We feel like we're one of the better special teams, uh, units. Um, we feel like last year we made a lot of gains there. We've got a good returner. We certainly, uh, uh, as you look at the personnel though, I think, um, the, the blocking schemes as you return it, it it's, this is this is gonna um, this is gonna evolve quickly, I think. And and to your point, do the body types possibly change? Yeah. How much does that change? It, when we, we see teams players in the draft, that there's a few elements. There's traits, all of that. But then there's also this mindset, you know, that some some players possess that tend to maybe uh, um, transfer over in, into that level. But I think. Um, it is something we're studying, and, and uh, it'll be interesting. Take us inside the war room. When you guys disagree on a player, how do you find compromise, especially when you're on the clock, right? You do an arm wrestle, rock, paper, scissors. Like, how do you guys get through that? Those are all – those conversations are done typically before the draft. And, you know, we have a difference of opinion, whether it's Sean, myself, myself, and another coach. We just watch. We just get more information, gather more information. Typically, that involves watching more tape together. Uh, we have group studies going on throughout our building right now for these clusters that I talked about to try to break a tie. We have a, you know, so um, I would say it never, it rarely gets to draft day. These discussions, we've had so many discussions. We spent so many hours in our draft room that uh, we've had most of these discussions. Our board will have been set. Um, so that rarely comes up in my 20 something years. We have, we have fun debate. Like we're, we're playing around. I mean, today there's Call it three segments in each round, and there's a group of players within that framework, and we're discussing 
oh, the middle of the fourth, let's say, these six players do we see? And, and it's not like without disagreement sometimes. I mean, you know, he and I on, on, on one position group have a haircut wagered on who goes first. Um, but, but they're right there. And, and so um, it's, it's, man, this is, this is, you know, this is the time. This process, it's interesting because I think I, I really like, you know, we, we go through the two weeks of readings with the scouts and the coaches, and then man, there's another week and a half where we're doing exactly what George said. We're, we're taking a segment later today. You know, we're, we'll be later, let's say later in this draft, and a lot of times when the draft ends and you're signing free agents, they may be players that were in, might be on your sixth round stack or your seventh round stack, and, and then um, really trying to order those relative to the funds you have after the draft to pay them and prioritize, you know. And so, um, yeah, I, 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 in, in my time, I would agree with George, I can't ever recall like one of those on draft day. I mean, it would be during the process where then you'd get more film out and you're like, there's no way or, you know, so, so we got a haircut wagered. I mean, every now and then, Sean will say during the draft, I, I really want this player. You know, let's go get him. Uh, but that's the, the extent of it. And, uh, but we all, or that's kind of the communication throughout the draft. There's certain players that, that um, you know, you always talk need versus talent. And, and I think one of the things that's really important is we are constantly articulate the vision. Like, all right, what do we see in year one? <clears throat> Um, is he competing to make the 53 possible practice squad player? Um, do we see a guy who's going to start? Do we see a guy who's going to, you know, really articulate the vision? And so certainly there are certain positions within the framework of our team right now where um, the vision could be clearer maybe than other positions. Um, and yet, that's that's when we're talking about a clump that's so then then that factors in. Um, but you know it, it it's got to be uh, it's got to be all done ahead of time. I mean it's it's in the process is it, I don't want to say it, it's enjoyable though. It's it's like it's long. You're in those rooms, but it's it's um, you get to know these yeah. guys. We'll spend four hours. On ten guys that we project in the fifth round, and there may be two of them there. So we're doing all the work. You know, by the time you get to the fifth round and you've talked about those players, a lot of them will be gone. So it's it just kind of, you know, the, the board kind of falls the way it falls if you've stacked it correctly and you spend a lot of time. You've invested in it. And then the the obvious, you took somebody oh earlier, and now you're in this clump of you know. Then maybe it affects. Doesn't mean you're, if the one's graded higher, you take another at that position. But there are a lot of things that go into it. Thank you. Thank you.